the Commission on the Way Forward started um, last year. The 2016 General Conference met and once again realized we have an impasse over the issues of broadly, you might say, LGBT, lesbian, G gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer persons, LGBTQ, that we, we sort of have an impasse over two particular areas, and I'm, I've got a slide about this later. Um, and the, the questions that are before us are leading the church to be in a deep level of conflict, and that level is, that conflict is uniquely expressed at what we call our general conference. Now, every United Methodist Church is governed by this book. It's called the Book of Discipline. And we try to live consistent to the Book of Discipline, congregation by congregation, which means that if you would go to another United Methodist Church in the area, or if you go across the U.S., or even across the world, you would find it's pretty much, it, you'd find it similar. Certainly not the same, but you'd find it similar. And a lot of the structure and that sort of thing will be exactly the same, and that's because of this governing book. This book is drafted once every four years by the General Conference. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the General Conference in a few minutes. But in this book, we have a section um, that talks about how we see social issues. And there's some language in that that's been there since for a long time. Um, Rob, Vaughn, do you know, does this go back to the 70s, this language? It goes back to, what, 74 in that zone? 72, thank you. Paragraph 161G, and it says, we affirm that all persons are individuals of sacred worth created in the image of God. All persons need the ministry of the church and their struggles for human fulfillment, as well as the spiritual and emotional care of a fellowship that enables reconciling relationships with God, with others, and with self. That's pretty easy, right? The United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality. Notice it says the practice of homosexuality. That's an important phrase. And it considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. We affirm that God's grace is available to all. We'll seek to live together in Christian community, welcoming, forgiving, and loving one another as Christ has loved and accepted us. We implore families and churches not to reject or condemn lesbian and gay members and friends. We commit ourselves to be in ministry for and with all persons. Now, the, the phrase at the very top, that sentence, the United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality, considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. That's really, that's the trigger. And there are two outcomes that the church has been, um, one might say discussing at General Conference, but really the word arguing would be a lot better. Well, it would be more descriptive and more true. Should the church offer marriage rights? I may have a, yeah, look at there. Will, <laughs> before I fell asleep, I was doing this. Yeah, I wrote this out. Um, by the way, I, I was just telling people, usually at about 7 o'clock, my brain, after a long Sunday, after four sermons, begins to just to turn off. And so this could get really fun in about 25 minutes. So, <laughs> But will United Methodist, the United Methodist Church offer marriage ceremonies to same-sex couples? Will that be a possibility? The assumption here would be essentially qualified same-sexual couples. That is to say, we, your clergy and all United Methodist churches have the ability to say no to a wedding. Um, I can think of a few I should have said no to. And the truth is, I kind of knew that I should have said no, but I didn't say no, and then within a very short period of time, I was like, you idiot, you should have said no. So what, what you assume of your clergy, by, by the way, it's only a few. And I've done a lot of weddings, so it's not a bad record. If I was a baseball player, you would hire me, okay? <laughs> so, so there's that, because nobody, you know, nobody can look into the crystal ball on these things. But, but this is assumption that, you know, you would, the clergy would have the same ability to make that decision about, to say, you know what, maybe you've got to go get another pastor to do this one. I'm, I don't feel good about this. Um, and then second, will the church ordain duly qualified, self-avowed, practicing homosexual persons to ministry and to serve in local churches. So the truth is, this impasse that we've come to, which is just like a level of conflict that's higher than you would ever want in your home or your church, essentially is over these three issues. That first sentence in that paragraph is often called the offensive language. 
Because if you're a if you if you know just think if 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 you were a gay person or if you have children who are LGBTQ and you read that, it's just like, ah, oh, wow. And so there are many people that find that offensive. Others, however, find it in keeping with the 2,000 year tradition of the church. So different people look at it different ways. And that's part of the conversation. But then it's these two issues. Now, are there other issues? Of course, there are other issues. But what I try to do is, in a one hour briefing, boil it down to the, to the basics. General Conference. General Conference is the worldwide meeting that happens every four years. There are 864 delegates. Half of them are lay people like you. Half of them are clergy like me. There are actually a couple pastors in the crowd here, so you know who you are. 58% uh, of those in 2016 were from the United States. The rest from, were from around the world. Just to give you a sample, the Virginia delegation, there were 22 of us, 11 laity and 11 clergy. There are about 1,000 clergy in Virginia. 11 of them were elected to go to General Conference. So that's, that's not many people. Interestingly, that's the second largest delegation in America. I think we're tied with North Georgia right now. Nine, we had a 19-year-old and we had people that are seniors, retired people. We had a, a racial mix. And interestingly, we had 11 men, 11 women. That just didn't have to happen that way, but it just happened to be that way. So good for us. Now, of those delegates, of those 864 delegates, 260 of them, 30% were from Africa, 40 were from Euro Europe and Eurasia, that's Eastern Europe, and 50 were from the Philippines, and then 10 were from what are called concordat churches. That's probably a word you've never heard before. Is that true? That's a church word. And a, a concordat is an agreement that churches enter into with people. And it's, it's a way of recognizing another group of people and saying, you know what? you can sort of be affiliated with us, but you're autonomous from us. And so these concordant churches, send, they get one vote apiece, and they're in like a whole denomination, but you only get one vote. Great Britain, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Caribbean, etc. Take, just read that. This is from Ron Heifetz at Harvard University. Adaptive processes don't require leadership with answers. It requires leadership that creates structures that hold people together through the very conflictive, passionate, and sometimes awful process of addressing questions for which there aren't easy answers. Someone should have sent this to me about a, over a year ago when they asked me, would you be on the commission the way forward? <laughs> because that's what we've been doing. And I love that he says... Does he say sometimes awful? Yes, yeah, sometimes awful. I love that. That's just great. And I really, if you've read Heifetz's Leadership on the Line and some of his other books, he is just outstanding in his work on, on leadership broadly. But I think this quote captures where we are. In 2016, we realized that we were at General Conference at a really awful impasse, and it was, in my opinion, it was just about to get really ugly when a group of, um, when it was proposed that we create a commission on way forward. And this commission would do the work slowly. And then it was proposed that we would also call a special general conference for the purpose of only dealing with these questions. No other business, no budget, no, no other committee work, no other, because here's the problem with the regular general conference, this issue is so big and so conflictive, it's hard to do all the other work and, and have your mind on it. And this issue is so big that when you do all the other work, you can never get your mind fully around it because it's like this. So the idea was, why don't we, why don't we have our council of bishops choose a bunch of people across the denomination and across the world? So the commission has global members. Hey? We have members from Africa and Europe and the Philippines and the United States. We have... Um, men and women, we have bishops, clergy, laity, we have deacons, elders, we have gender differences, we have straight, we have um, three gay people that are on the commission, we have, so they tried to really say, if we took the 
12 million United Methodists around the globe and shook it really hard, what would randomly pop out the top? Let's get that type of, of integration, but the church also reached out and, and the bishops had to confer together, the bishops had to nominate people, and those nominations led to the invitations. And so um, that's what we've been doing. So we've been meeting, and the other, the other um, axis that's happened on the commission is we have very traditional people, some of whom run really large, um, they often call them renewal groups, that are trying to get to the church, the United Methodist Church, to a more traditional space in its understanding of Scripture and social issues. And people that have been very much a part of um, more progressive groups, especially around the areas of human sexuality, like Reconciling Ministries Network. So the former executive director has been on our board, and, and people that have memberships in RMN are on, it, on the commission as well. And so um, they've, they've really tried to do, and I, I actually even... This is one of the things that on the commission we kind of agree on, that the bishops, we feel like, I mean, sure, we think that, but, you know, because we're there, but um, I've been so grateful for the way this group has done its work because I'm in meetings, I'm in meetings, when we meet, we meet for like four days at a time, and let me tell you something, if you don't get along after four days, you got, you're either going to love people or, you know, it's going to be Agatha Christie here before it's all over, right, you know, and how did that one disappear today, you know, and, and so... It's been really great that all of these people have worked in really good faith, but it's also true that we have not found what I call the golden scepter. We have not, we ended our eighth meeting, which is one where we really needed to have be projected into the plans now for how we will move into the future, and I'm going to tell you about those in a second. And a guy across the room saw my face on the afternoon of the last day, and he texted me, he said, are you Okay. And I didn't realize how sad I felt until I read his text. And then I was like, oh my goodness, you're really, you're down. So, you know, lament is a biblical thing. It's, it's allowed. And I was lamenting that we never found the golden scepter. We found, two, we found plans that we're putting before the bishops now. But did we find a plan that would make these 32 people happy? No. And if you can't make those 32 people happy, trust me, you didn't make the 12 million happy. But what made me even sadder is I don't think such a plan exists. Because I, if such a plan existed, I think somebody else would have already found it. And they would have written it up. And between 1972 and 2016, they would have brought it to the General Conference. And so far, everything that's been brought to the General Conference has been voted away or not even brought to the floor. So the work is really hard work. It's this kind of work. The people on the commission have done it in really good faith. We have had so many candid conversations, and we've done this work, but we haven't come to a place where we're all going, and that's why we're all going to back this together. That's, that's not what it is, but what we have done is said, we're going to do our level best to give the best plans we can give to our bishops so that they'll have the best plans to give the general conference. And I feel really great about that, and I feel like that's got a lot of integrity to it. So I've, it's been a good experience, even though it's been sometimes awful process of addressing questions for which there aren't easy answers. Another member of the commission sent this to me on Friday. He said, hey, I just found this quote. What do you think? I was like, oh man, that is it. <laughs> so just so you know something more about your church as we go into this conversation, there are um, five jurisdictions. That's what we call them. So let me, let me orient you. This is Flourish United Methodist Church. We have a charge conference then there is a district. It's the Arlington District. It has a district conference. Conference is our word. Then there are annual conferences. That's like the Virginia Annual Conference. So think of the state of Virginia, northern Virginia, all the way down to Tidewater and the eastern shore, and over to Christiansburg, because you got to have Virginia Tech in your conference. <laughs> so they had to they had the inclusion there. That was just super important. But then everything south of Christiansburg, that's actually another annual conference called Holston. So that's our annual conference. And then the co annual conference falls into a jurisdiction. So we're in the yellow-orange one. See where it says Virginia? Um, we are in the uh, southeastern jurisdiction. That's the largest jurisdiction in the U.S. Now, what else is the southeastern jurisdiction as you're looking at the map? It's the Bible Belt, right? So now the second largest annual conference 
uh, jurisdictional conference is the South Central jurisdiction. That's including, you know, Texas to Oklahoma to, um, you know, all the way over to New Mexico. That's sort of the end of the Bible Belt through there. And then you can see, then we have the Western jurisdiction, which is a very large jurisdiction because there aren't as many United Methodist churches. And that's because John Wesley, you know, Francis Asbury landed in America on the East Coast and the Methodists made their way to the West Coast, but we didn't, we kind of conked out there somewhere <laughs> because we didn't, we didn't cover the West as well as the East. And so then, then there's the two in between, so the North East and the North Central. So those are the jurisdictions. Now, as you can imagine, there are certain voting patterns that are present in those places in the United States. Wouldn't you agree? And your church world does not significantly differ from the voting patterns of the country. Now, here's what's interesting about the United Methodist context. I believe that we are the last big tent church. It used to be that we had all these mainline denominations that were pretty large and, and connected, and we had progressive people, and we had conservative people, and we had, most of us were in the broad center, and we held that tension. But in more recent years, the Presbyterians have started to break up, the Episcopalians certainly did, the Lutherans have broken up, and the Baptists were, um, in the 1980s, the Southern Baptist Convention was fully taken over by more conservative folks, and now there are different Baptist branches that are broken off from that, and so the United Methodists were the last one. But this issue has uh, the power to do that because for some reason this is an unusually powerful issue. And I've never, I'm still not settled about why it is, I just know that it is. Because I've got really good friends who have said, if we don't change, I'm leaving. And I've got really good friends that have said to me, if we change, I'm leaving. And I thought, well, there it is. So in politics, I think you'd call that a wedge issue. Now, people are not issues. What I'm pointing to is not the, where we should be or where we are. What I'm pointing to is just the fact of the power of this for your denomination. That's why the General Conference said, maybe we should do this slowly and carefully. And maybe we should do it in a way that we've never done it before because apparently getting together once every four years with a group of strangers and putting them in a large auditorium for a total of 10 days, maybe that's not the best way to do this. So they created this commission. And, and even despite that, I think we've done the work really well and carefully. But despite that, there's no golden scepter that I have found or that others have found. And we've looked for it. Where we are, there's sort of a spectrum of thought around this, um, the questions that I raised earlier about the paragraph 161 and the question about ordination and marriage. And this is something I've shown, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. Those of you who have been to the briefing before, you've heard more than enough, but there are, there are people that are more traditional, which means that they like to do what's been done in the past. And some of them are so traditional as to be non-compatible. So what that means is, if you change anything, I'm leaving. But some of the traditional people are like, as long as I don't have to change what I do, I'm compatible with a church where other people do something different. I'm okay with that. Some of my really good friends are in this zone. They're traditional compatibilist. Some of us are progressive compatibilist. That means we want the church to become more progressive in these zones. But if other people want to hold a more traditional view and they don't want to do any weddings or they don't want their annual conference to have gay clergy, you know, we don't, we don't need to break the, the denomination of that. But some people are progressive incompatibilist, non-compatibilist, and what that means is unless it goes fully progressive, they want out. Now, I would argue that the broad compatible center has tended to be the makeup of the United Methodist Church on most big social issues. And what we don't know and what's going to be tested is where the denomination is on this, these issues. And we've got no data. Um, some of us have su suggested many times that we actually go get the Gallup organization or some large organization like that. Let's get some survey data and see where we are and what, what we're thinking. But that hasn't been done, and that's, that's okay. That's where we are. So I want you to turn to your neighbor for a minute, okay? And I want you just to think for a minute, like different groups of people. I want you to think like a really traditional person. A really traditional person tends to say, 
The Bible has about six to eight passages on homosexuality that, that they would say are, are valid and, and are focused on that issue, and they're not positive, and therefore we should not change our current practices. It's the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, what these people, I just want to say, in a United Methodist context, the vast majority of these people would say gay people are welcome into the life of the church. It's the practice that, that they would find worrisome. Then there are people in the middle, and the people in the middle have a lot of concerns about where the church is headed to and where, what might happen, the breakup of the church or keeping the church together. And then there are people that are really progressive, and they'd really like to see a change. And traditionalists tend to read the law, the Old Testament Hebrew law, think the first five books of the Old Testament, and then the Apostle Paul. People in the progressive camp tend to read the prophets, and they call for justice for all people, and especially for the downtrodden, and the gospels. And that they say is Jesus was silent on this issue, but Jesus taught about the rule of love. So one thing I want to level set as we begin any conversation with each other is that it's not that these people own the Bible and these people don't use it. That is completely false. And I've sat through enough four-day meetings to tell you that ain't true. But what is true is we all use the Bible, but we do sometimes emphasize different parts of it, depending on where we're at. And that's just something to think about as you start talking about this. But we're going to take about five minutes, and I want you to try to get one sentence for each of these groups. What is one thing that traditional people might be concerned about the future of the church, if it would change? What's one thing that people in the center would be concerned about as they think about where the church is headed or what might change? What's one thing that progressive people might be concerned about? And I want you to get, I, some of you are going to want to spend all of your time in one zone, amen? And it's probably the zone that you live in. And you're going to want to tell the person next to you, all the reasons that you're right about whatever it is you think. And I just, uh, trust me, I've spent a lot of time in four-day meetings, and I've just about had, no, it's not like that. Uh, what I, I just, I just, it's human nature. What I'm trying to get you to do, though, is work with like at least one, but maybe two or three people. You might even turn around and just reach out to people you don't even know. Make sure you introduce yourself very briefly, give your name, but then say, hey, what have you heard? And try to get one thing in each area. Can you do that? Okay, you've got five minutes, go. Make sure somebody's remembering what you say. Hey, somebody just said to me, hey, what's the point of what we're doing because we're not sure? 
it, the point is to think, just take a minute and think like a traditional person, think like a moderate person, and think like a progressive person. You're not trying to convince anybody or prepare for anything. We just want to see if you can get into that space for a moment and just identify one thing. That's what we're trying to do. You have one more minute, so move to the, if you haven't gotten to the end yet, move quickly. One more minute. Okay, let's see if I've got the right side. Oh, rats, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, all right. Okay, very quickly. What are, um, just raise your hand, and we don't have a mic, so you're going to have to say it really loud and really short. Did everybody just hear me say short? If you catch me on Sunday mornings, I'm super polite, but on Sunday evenings, no, I'm not. I am not looking for a speech. I'm looking for a phrase or a sentence. I am not looking for a paragraph. Amen? amen. Let all the people say Amen. amen. Okay. Traditional. Give me something that traditional people are concerned about. Yes. The fear of change. Fear of change. Yeah. Give me another thing. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Where will the change end? The change end? Yeah. Thank you very much. In the back. Yes. A little bit louder. What's next? Yes. Yeah. That's right. What else? Fear of progressives. Yeah, that's actually, I've been in meetings where that is stated out loud. Yes. Standards. There is, by that I mean, there are certain beliefs that we believe, that the church has believed in. You're Will we lose our standards? Right. Will we lose our standards? If you, you know, if you compromise one place, do you compromise everywhere? Any, well, here's, let me just show you some I thought of. That These are not ones I thought of, but things I've heard. But it's not an all-inclusive list, but it is a list that might help you understand how traditional people tend to think. There's a slippery slope. If the church changes its view on gay marriage and ordination, what's next? Now, let me tell you, when you get into an African context, they are a lot more traditional than any American than you have ever met. And so the, some of the examples that they will give of what's next, while patently absurd, demonstrate their deep fear of this issue. Concern that United Methodist Church will no longer be a tradition that encourages sanctification and the pursuit of personal holiness, as traditionally understood in Scripture. 
boards and agencies. By the way, none of you brought this up because you're not, you're not denomination people, you're church people. If you're denomination people, you would know that a lot of traditionalists don't trust the denominational superstructure. They, they feel like the boards and agencies aren't worth their while. They, why are we spending all this money? Why are we doing these things? Except for a couple. One is Westpath. That's our board of pension and health benefits. There is one thing that all United Methodists believe in. Can I just tell you that? <laughs> Especially the clergy. Westpath. We, we are profoundly grateful. You know, let us praise the pension plan. And, and also UMCOR, which is, does a lot of relief work. People are really good. UMVIM, which is a volunteer's admission. And then GCF&A is the financial process that gets everything where it's going. And people have a pretty high trust level with that too, which is great when they still believe in the financial accountability of the church. Amen? That's great. And then there's disappointment in the Council of Bishops. They feel that they haven't enforced the Book of Discipline evenly or fairly. They feel like they have not reversed the decline of the denomination. And what you, when you get into these conversations where, that you think are just about marriage and ordination, you quickly discover that we're about to talk about some other things at the same time. Now, that's not an all-inclusive list, but I, I have heard these are things that I've heard. And I've heard them from some of the leaders of the Big Renewal, Good News, the WCA, Confessing Movement. These are renewal groups in the United Methodist Church that are traditional in nature. Oh, wait. Moderates. What are, what it's a, what are moderates worried about? Yes. They're afraid of division. They just don't want it to divide. Having to make a decision. Oh my goodness. I wish you would know how many times people have said, just don't make us vote on anything. <laughs> and and I'm, I go, so we're, we got to solve like the deepest problem in Methodism, but nobody has to vote on anything. <laughs> no, make it. And everybody wants it one level up. Don't make my local church vote. Make the district vote. <laughs> and that's like the district superintendents go, make the conference vote. And then the conferences go, make the jurisdictions vote. And I'm like, you know we're back at general conference on one more step, right? So, so nobody wants to vote. What else do moderates worry about? Here's some things I've heard. They're really worried about the witness of church around unity. Jesus' prayer for unity resonates with them. That's one of the passages that moderates quote a lot. They do not think that the differences of opinions and practices related to gay marriage and ordination are church dividing issues. They believe, see, and that's because the broad center are compatibilist. You may be traditional, you may be progressive, but do we really have to divide the, the local church or the denomination over this? That's how the moderates tend to think. Do not, they don't want the legacy and the current ministry of the United Methodist Church to be deconstructed. Because what they know is once you start dividing, those boards and agencies are all going to go away, most of them, and there's, there's just going to be a different Methodism out there. And they're concerned about the church's ability to reach large numbers of young adults and others in the United States when we're holding a traditional view on same-sex marriage and ordination. Because many of us have kids who have just said, I won't go to that church. And I don't care how good the preaching is, I don't care how good the music is, if you don't accept my gay friends, I'm not going. So a lot of moderates look at that and they're like, well, maybe we ought to change that. And if you're a deep traditionalist, you'd say, well, then what's next? Slippery slope, right? But if you're here, you're like, if we hold that stand, the future is really in doubt. So what do progressives think? What did you say about that one? Progressives. What, what did progressives often, what's their concern? Fear of being excluded. A fear of being excluded. We don't like excluding people. What else? We feel like that people are not being heard. And, and progressives are in probably a smaller number in the Methodist church, deep progressives, and so they often feel in the minority. Somebody had a hand up? Yes? Uh, the fear of no change. Yeah, I mean, it'll just be the same old thing, and we'll be pounding this out. And anybody else have one? Yes? The image of God. The, that the image of God is in everyone, including LGBTQ persons, and therefore we should affirm the image of God in all of us, which would mean greater inclusion. Did I, did I capture that? You can tell I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. Here's what I've heard. <clears throat> These are issues of justice, and they're very concerned about the church's ability to reach a large number of young adults, but everything you said I've also heard. But I was doing this at night, and I kind of ran out of steam right there, so sorry. So, now, here's what I want you to understand. When you really start listening to people with what on the commission we've been using this book, oh, shoot. the Arbinger Institute, the Anatomy of Peace. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Man, I'm dying. 
Um, you can see, look, what time is it? Look, 7.05, there it is. <laughs> Touchdown, I told you. I did not just make that up either. The anatomy of peace, if you have a heart of peace, you don't have to agree with everybody, but thank you for the way you just said everything you just said. You just demonstrated a really important thing. It's possible to say things where we disagree without being ugly or grinding other people down in the process. So that's a really, that, that piece of listening and understanding, that's great, thank you. Um, so part of what you have to think about is why the outcome matters to you. And here's, okay, turn to the person next to you. You're here. I don't know how many of you are, but this is pretty good. This is the largest group we've had at one of these things. Why does this matter to you? So just tell the person next to you or the people in that little group you formed one reason that this matters to you. It can be any reason at all. It doesn't have to be your most profoundly personal reason, but what's the reason that it matters to you? Take 30 more seconds. Why does the outcome matter to you? All right, stop where you're at. You want to engage in this dialogue in your church or in the Methodist church broadly, it's really important that you start, that you figure that one out. Um, I've had to do this a couple times because I've, you've, to keep energy alive and just to sort of reboot before every meeting, I've got to kind of remind myself why to spend this much time on something that's this frustrating. And I, I am not complaining when I say it's been a long time, a lot of time, but those of you who are florist members, you've given me broad discretion over my time, and I really appreciate it, and I want you to know it's been a lot of time. I couldn't be any more grateful to the level of support this church has offered me. It's been unbelievable. There is everybody to the person has done nothing but say, glad you're doing it, and I, I really appreciate that so much. Y'all just been so terrific to me, but I've, I kind of made my list. Now, I'm a, what's called a progressive compatibilist, so I'm sort of ready for the church to open this thing up, and I, I've said that many times. Hi, my name's Tom. I'm a progressive compatibilist, you know. <laughs> and now what do you all say? Hi, Hi Tom. Tom. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, so I've had to think about why is that important to me? And here's, here's a piece of my list. I'm that way because Christ's call to unity in John 17 is really important to me, and that's biblical. And it's the prayer of Jesus that the church be one is he and the Father and the Spirit are one. And so... The union of the Trinity is a, is a theological construct that the church is to mimic, and I think that's really important. I'm also a believer in the shared ministry of the United Methodist Church, and I wouldn't be, but I've traveled too much. I've seen the churches we built in Cuba. I've helped build churches in Mexico. I've traveled in, I've been in Ghana. I've been in Sierra Leone many times. I never forget the first time I went to Sierra Leone, and they, we were at the school, this kissy uh, compound that had a school and a clinic, uh, a United Methodist eye doctor out of Minnesota, Dr. Glass, who'd come over there many times and built this eye clinic and trained people. Sierra Leoneans were doing cataract surgeries. And the blind, honestly, I got to see cataract surgery in 1997 because I was with a group of physicians, two physicians and a nurse. And, they, and the guy walks in and he goes, hey, do you want to see cataract surgery? And before I can say, heck no, all the, all the medical people are like, yes, and they're putting gloves on me, and I'm like, we're really doing this. And, and listen, this woman walks in, and she's blind, 
And she walks out and she can see. And Jesus said about his miracles, he said, hey, you think what I'm doing great? Greater things than these you will do. And I thought about that scripture and I thought we're actually doing more miracles than Jesus did. All because this guy in Minnesota, I don't know how he feels about homosexuality. I'm just really glad he's in, in Sierra Leone doing that, right? So the shared ministry is really important. Oh, there was this UMW vocational training center that all these women were learning after the Civil War in Sierra Leone. They were all learning how to sew and make clothing and be tailors. Just amazing. Oh, I'm getting a call. It's my brother. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can't take it right now. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about now. Okay. I, I think the current witness of the church related to the inclusion of gay persons, I just have to tell you, I think we're in a compromised place. When you talk to gay people and you say, you're very welcome here, but you can't get married here, they don't hear you're very welcome here anymore. You can, you can, say, you can say, you can still hold a traditional view, but I just want to tell you, I've spent time in real conversations with LGBTQ persons. And I need to tell you the truth that they tell me. Now, I think the, church is, the Methodist Church has tried to do a tremendous balancing act, and I really appreciate my traditional friends who have done that. And they've done it lovingly and kindly. But I think that our witness, this is Tom, I just think our witness is compromised. Um, the ability of the church to reach Christians and others who believe, people in our society who aren't Christians. Friends, for a lot of people, this is a make or break issue. And it, for a lot of our kids, this is a make or break issue. But in some of our families, it's our brothers and our parents. Right? You don't have to be young to be progressive. You don't have to be young to worry about justice. And finally, that last one's probably not one that you've thought about, is it? The pre-82 pension of the United Methodist Church was built exactly like Social Security. It's a defined benefit plan, 100%, and it assumes the church will stay together until the year 2080. You may say, why 2080? Because a lot of our old pastors marry young. That's why. So we have this liability tale and then we have the next benefit plan, which also has a defined benefit portion that's pretty broad. And then we had our next pension plan, which had a smaller defined benefit plan. Do you see what we're doing? We're on a spectrum moving from 100% defined benefit to 100% defined contribution. And I stood up six years ago and made the minority report on the pension fund at General Conference and said, we ought to be at 100% defined contribution. And it turns out I was right. And I just want everybody to know that. I was right about that. But if this thing breaks up, and my, my friends that are in big renewal groups tend to want to do magic thinking around pension funds, and you can't, that's, that's irresponsible. And what's interesting is most traditional people I know are fiscally conservative like I am. One of my big values is being fiscally conservative. So part of that is you've got to pay your bills. But the thing that worries me on a biblical level is the oldest people on our pension plan are the most vulnerable of our clergy. And so we, we just have to be aware. Now, the good news is we're not 100% unfunded. We are marginally unfunded depending on the annual conference. But if, the annual, if one annual conference doesn't pay it, the system has to pay it. So if you have a broad breakup, pension liability is a big deal. Now, let's switch gears. What are the bishops going to receive? Because it is now, okay, this is the space, Anna. Okay, Anna's with me. This is Anna Cherry. She's one of our Wesley um, interns, our Wesley fellows, who's been here for a year now, just about. And Anna's coming forward right now. And she's standing up here with her microphone. I thought you were going to introduce me later. Oh, I am. <laughs> oh, you're going to love this, but I wanted to see you stand here and be uncomfortable while I do it. Anna is awesome. Okay? And so, yeah, she is. And so I... I offered to put together this train the trainer event in Richmond that would help people go out on the districts and train local churches on how to have this exact conversation. And I, and I said, we need a resource that helps people talk about LGBTQ persons and all the issues that come into that in church life. And I don't know how to do that. 
And Anna goes, well, I was at Messiah College and I kind of <laughs> did that while I was at Messiah College with people there. And I was like, can you put this together? And she says, yeah. And I'm sort of capturing, minimizing the conversation, but this was the conversation. And I said, well, why don't you do that? And she did, and it's really great. And so we're going to run a group like that at Floris, and the group is called... Dialoguing with Dignity. you got to get right up here. Dialoguing with Dignity. Yeah, and so now Anna's going to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so essentially this program was created in response to the need that this is a complex conversation with deep emotions, and if we're really going to address this with hearts of peace, we need to invest some time into it. Um, so it's a six-week series, and it's focusing on uh, what are we talking about? So what's the language and terminology we're using surrounding LGBT people um, in this conversation? And then how are we talking about it? So both looking at ourselves and the emotions and baggage that we carry into the conversation and learning strategies for having peace-filled conversations with others, and then where we go from here. So what we're doing both as an individual congregation and as a denomination um, and using this as a launch point into the next step. Um, so I'm going to be passing around clipboards. If you're interested, um, just put down your name and email. We're hoping to start in early June, but that depends on interest and availability of those involved. And we're looking for people who are progressive and people that are in the center and people that are traditional to sit and have the conversation together because this, for florists, this is going to be sort of our, our um, what, what, do you, what do you call when you're testing something? Yeah, it's like the trial, like the beta, right? It's like that. And we want to, we want to see how it goes here, and then we want to offer other groups as well. Jesse? At the end of this, which I think this is great that you're doing this, yeah. but is this just so that we learn to talk about it, or is this for us to be able to come out the other end with maybe a recommendation that we want you guys to know about before you vote? Um, it, I think, in general, this is to learn how to talk about it, I don't think there's a component that says that this group would make a recommendation to give to general conference delegates, right? No, not generally. Um, the series, the last week of the series does end with a panel that's open to the general congregation um, that's talking about where we are as a church individually. Um, so we'll be talking about like what programs we'll be running or what the future looks like if there's any new book studies happening. Um, it's not designed to be a beginning and end of a conversation, but rather the first step. But Jesse, I will say this. I'm going to show you a timeline at the end of this. And on that timeline, there are places where you can contact the general conference delegates. I think that if people do this experience, they're going to be in a much better place to write a cogent letter and share, here's what we think. Um, now, whether Flores UMC can reach unanimity around that as a church, I think might be um, like we'd probably have to start a commission the way forward here, which... Oh boy. Okay, but but you but I think it's going to be a great thing. So if you want to sign up, there are a couple of sign ups around. Just put your name and email address. Now, two plans. Our council of bishops on Sunday of next week will start their meeting, either Sunday or Monday, and they are going to receive two plans from the commission the way forward. We sent them three plans, and they said work on these two. The first plan that we sent was a traditional plan. And what it did is it took the, the way the Book of Discipline is today and strengthened the language and made it, um, required the bishops to execute on that language. So if I would do a gay wedding, I would be out. One strike, you're out. And so it just tightened it up. And what the Council of Bishops says is, essentially, we already have that plan. It's called the Book of Discipline right now. Now, my, my deep traditional friends would not agree with me the way I just said that, but I'm just telling you, it's very similar to where the Book of Discipline is, right? They didn't make it harder. Like, they didn't say no gay people allowed. They would never do that. That's not who they are. But what the bishops did do is they say, hey, these other two plans that are very different from where we are now, work on those harder. We would really like you to develop those. Um, this document is about 80 pages that's going to them and includes these two plans. The one church plan, that's one of the two plans. By the way, the confidentiality agreement I have with the commission is still in place. So what I did is I went through the United Methodist News Service and I read everything that was out there on these two plans. And luckily, one of our bishops in Texas talked a lot just recently. And I was like, awesome, buddy, because now I'm going to use your stuff and it's all good. And, and he used the right terms. So I can use those terms because it's all out there. But 
just know that if, if there are some times where you ask a question, I avoid it, it's because I'm going to try to do the, my best that I can to keep that agreement. Um, so here they are. One plan says this. It provides um, a generous unity that gives conferences, churches, and pastors the flexibility to uniquely reach their missional context in relation to human sexuality without changing the connectional structure. It's a centrist plan, make no doubt about it. And what it says is, it's a little bit like the Episcopalians. All pastors may, here's what the Episcopal Church says, all pastors may do same-sex marriages for qualified couples, no pastor must. All may, no must. And that's, that's a way of trying to keep something together in the broad center. Around ordination, you might think of, wow, could you do that with ordination? Could we say all conferences may, but no must, right? But then you'd have to think about the people who have said that's not progressive enough or that's not traditional enough, and you'd have to think about if they really couldn't stand being there, where would they go? And you'd probably have to think about some provisions for that. But the idea behind a plan like this, and there was a, a plan at the last general conference that was offered called the local option. What I've discovered is there are about four or five families of plans that anybody's going to think of, and there are variations within the family. So think of a genus, but then a species. Well, there are families of plans, and so in the traditional plan, you could come up with a number of options of a traditional plan, but they'd all be in that same family. This one church plan, it's a family of plans, but we've created one option. Then there's another one, Oh, by the way, here's an assumption that is, I can state. No one would expect the African church or the Philippines church to do what the American church does. I've not spoken to one United Methodist anywhere. The most progressive people I know would not expect Africa and the Philippines, which are deeply traditional spaces, where the practice of homosexuality is outlawed in half the countries of Africa right now, and in a couple, it's a death penalty. So we wouldn't expect... Africans to do that. But here's the great thing, while our commission is working, there's another commission of people that are also having a boatload of fun, and they are trying to figure out how we can have one book of discipline for us all. Think of like Lord of the Rings, like one ring for them all. And then, then you'd have separate books of discipline in different regions of the world, so maybe you could parse some of this out that way. So, then there's a connectional conference plan. This used to be called the multi-branch plan, but the bishop in Texas says that it's now called the connectional conference plan. And what it would do is, remember back here where I showed you the jurisdictional conferences in the United States? There we go. And I said there are five of them. What if instead of five geographical conference jurisdictions, you had three essentially ideological jurisdictions? And those ideological jurisdictions would be conferences, connectional conferences, they would be, one would be progressive, one would be contextual, meaning the center, and one would be traditional. You could do it that way. That's also a family of plans that's been suggested in the past. But I will say it's one thing to suggest an idea and it's another thing to drill down and figure out all the implications for everything. Now within that plan, annual conferences would decide which connectional conferences to affiliate with only local churches who choose a branch other than the one. So let's say the, the Virginia Annual Conference went progressive, but your church wanted to be central. It would probably give the ability of a local church to choose outside of their annual conference and be reassigned to a different annual conference. So maybe a bishop, our bishop would be in West Virginia, for instance. But they would be in that jurisdiction. Does that make sense? because you're dividing the country up by ideology. What's odd about this is you're dividing all of Methodism in America up based on what you think about one issue. Doesn't that feel odd? Yeah. So, it's just, I mean, it's, I'm not telling anything that, no, that people haven't said before. It just feels sort of odd. And this drives the voting. All these plans are going to require broad voting. So you really can't make a change without letting people vote even when they're telling you, but we don't want to vote. But you can make it so that there is a default setting 
And if they want to get out of the default setting, then they vote. So if they have a low conflict threshold, they don't ever have to vote. But if they're willing to do the candor and do the work of the conversation, then they can have a vote and they can change from the default. So it's two plans. And I can't, like, as I look at these slides, I'm like, you've spent the last year of your life and that's t three slides, like that's it? Well, that's about 80 pages worth of material. But let me stop there. What questions might you have about any of this? Dave? A little bit louder. Dave, this is a really fun question you're asking. Like, if I had a question that I would plant in the audience, this would be one of them. And what he said is, have there been other issues in the Methodist tradition through time, either in the United Methodist Church or in the predecessor organizations, that have been this big but have resolved over time? And the answer is yes. Those would include... And I've got a couple of other folks here who know things. And if you think of some I don't, would you please raise your hand and, and to help me? It took us a long time to figure out if we were going to ordain women. We got that one wrong for a long time. And the first women were ordained about 52 years ago. Is that right, Rob? About 52, 55 years ago. 1956. So we did figure that one out. Now, once we did it at a general conference level... As you can imagine, it took local churches a very long time to accept that, and there are still United Methodist churches today who say to superintendents, do not send us a woman, because it says right here in the Bible that men should be in leadership. So we're still in there, but it's the vast minority. Another issue, if you go back a little bit further, would be, well, actually 50 years ago, we ended what's called the Central Conference. And the Central Conference was a segregated church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really helpful, Glenn. Central jurisdiction. And the old central jurisdiction is where all of the African-American Methodist churches were. So we had a white church, but then within it we had this African-American church, and finally in the 60s people just said, this is crazy. Like, we've got to be an integrated church. And you know who was really worried about that integration? African-Americans, because they said, once we get integrated, we're going to lose all of our power. And what was really powerful is an African-American bishop was elected, and people just were like, that was a miracle. But it took a long time before African-Americans had equity within the broader system. And we still struggle with racial reconciliation today, so we're not there. Um, another issue, going back further, would be slavery. In that case, we divided. We divided into the Emmy Church, Methodist Episcopal Church South. I grew up in an Emmy Church South. Slavery was over when I entered that church, just once you know my age. <laughs> but um, the prevailing attitudes had not all gone away in Winchester, Virginia. Just down the street from us was Market Street United Methodist Church, was an Emmy, Emmy North Church that had broken off of Braddock Street Methodist Church because they were more progressive on the issue of slavery. And down the street from that was John Mann United Methodist Church. This is in one, this is in one, two, three blocks, no joke, Winchester, Virginia, still like this today. There was John Mann United Methodist Church, all African-American church, because even those African-Americans said, if we go to a, a white progressive church, we're still, not gonna, we're still gonna be sitting in the balcony. So they formed their own congregation. So when the central jurisdiction was brought back in, John Mann came back into the Methodist fold would be the example. Can you all think of any other issues like that? Divorce. Oh, divorce. Talk about divorce. Divorce was a similar, similar to this occurred in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It did split the church, but the rhetoric was every bit as violent and significant as uh, what's happening now. Anybody in the room, you don't have to raise your hand, anybody in the room divorced, you would have been shamed at best and dismissed at worst. So we need to understand that this line is one that the United Methodist Church has been trying to hold together for a couple hundred years. We haven't always been called United Methodist. We've been called Methodist. And we've been trying to do it in these different topics for years and years and years. 
and some of those topics at a different time were your topics. It's always easier to do it with somebody else's topic. Amen? <laughs> so that's been my experience. I love talking about other people's problems. I'm so reasonable. It's when you get into my junk that I really get hung up. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. To what degree do we have input? That's the first question. It's really an interesting point about. They do. I was about to say, they often feel like, hey, I really believe in the Bible too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what was the first question? <laughs> to what degree do you have input? So, first, um, the 22 delegates going to the 2019 General Conference, when, the, when we get a little bit closer, I'll release those names. If you want to write letters, if you want to write email, whatever you, you'd like to do to contact those delegates, I'm one of those delegates. And so, you know, I'm around. And then uh, Rob's, a, you're a delegate. And so that's another one. And Rob's over at Community Faith United Methodist Church. So it's pretty crazy that you've got two clergy within a mile of each other at different churches. Um, but you can write any of the delegates, Teresa. You can write all the delegates to General Conference, and we get letters and we read them. Um, I get letters, and some of them are really well thoughtfully written, and others are um, less, um, less so. Some of them are more reactive than others. There are some letters that I know you have not written, even though the viewpoint that they're writing is traditional, but some of the letters I get are, are progressive that are pretty rough. So one thing I would tell you is when the time comes, do what you just did. State your opinion and state who you are in a way that allows the, the delegate to enter into your position rather than feeling under attack. That's really helpful what you just did. Um, what can we do? Eventually, it may get to, we don't know which plan will be accepted, but I think that eventually one of two things is going to happen. One of these plans will be, well, one of three things. One of these two plans will go to general conference and be accepted. That's one option. If that happens, local churches are going to have to vote on something. It may just be whether we allow gay marriages to be, or same-sex marriages to be held in this building, or whether the pastor will do those off-site. By the way, about 90% of the weddings I do right now are off-site anyway, so that's not a big deal. Um, what was, it, may, it could be the local church will have to decide what conference it wants to be in. That'll be a church-wide thing. But ultimately, the vote that everybody will have is whether you still want to be a United Methodist. And what I'm trying to figure out is how do we keep as many of us together until that time comes as possible, because I don't think it's something we want to give up on. Mostly what I don't want to give up on are my relationships here and the people I know and the good work we do around the world. That means a lot to me, and I think we can hold that together. A second thing that could happen is someone will make a substitute motion at general conference and introduce a plan that's not here or modify these plans so that they don't really look like these plans. That's a parliamentarian way of managing conflict, which is you, you just substitute and substitute until eventually you're talking about a whole new thing. And the third thing that could happen is nothing. And if nothing happens, the same words that have been with us since 1972 will still be here, and then people will decide what they're going to do after that. And I think if that happens, I think more progressive clergy will begin to do marriages whether or not they're allowed to. And I think uh, some bishops will prosecute and bring people to church trials and other bishops won't. And I think that's going to be very, very conflictual and messy if that happens. And if nothing happens, um, it could be that progressive, it could be the Western jurisdiction will say, we've had enough and we're out of here, or other conferences may do that. 
I cannot predict what will happen if nothing happens. There have been. Currently, the rate is significantly less than it was before the commission was formed. It is still happening, but at a, at a slower rate, I think. And the rate before the commission was not sky high. I mean, we're, we're talking about one or two. But that did affect people. Churches that are more traditional said, I'm losing members. That's what that whole sugar packet thing's about, and I just can't bear to go into that one more time. So, <laughs> another, any other questions? Yes? A little bit louder. You, you couldn't, the, first, the first slide basically said that the church does not condone uh, special language fracking. 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 Are there other things that the church does not condone? Um, the question yeah, is... That, that <clears throat> yeah, so here's the, here's the line, right? So what you're really talking about is your clergy, the standard for clergy. Because the laity, man, you guys get to do it all. I'm mean, serious. Like, we used to not drink. Do you realize that? Methodists were teetotalers. We were the people who brought you the temperance movement. Talk about some of our really big, great ideas. The, the temperance movement, which sent alcoholism sky high in the United States and gave people alcohol that killed them. Um, and and the, after the temperance movement was lifted, we had more people using alcohol than we had before. That's what we, that was our idea. Our building downtown in Washington was the Temperance League. They built it. It's right on Capitol Hill. It's amazing, the real estate we've got. I mean, seriously, you're looking at the Supreme Court and the Capitol building from our real estate. But that's how big the temperance movement was. There is not a United Methodist home I walk into in Northern Virginia that is not okay, at least with other people drinking, if they don't themselves. Now, obviously, people that have dealt with alcohol, alcoholism, they don't feel the same way. But I'm just saying that it, clergy... We used to not be able to smoke, but they let us smoke now. The problem is it'll kill you. So it's like, <clears throat> I mean, what good is that? Thank you very much for your letting us smoke. But what, what, what the Book of Discipline says for clergy is, if we drink or smoke, we can do it. We just have to prove that we do it for the glory of God. <laughs> which, which is down in a footnote. It's down in the footnote, but I've got friends that will raise a glass and say to the glory of God, you know, they're... They're all in, and, they're, and they're, not, they're not drinking to excess. I want to be really clear. <clears throat> it's a little Methodist joke, a little clergy joke. Just don't, it's late. I should go home now before it all comes out. So I think you said, is there anything that, other things we can't do? Yeah, there are a lot of other things. Um, if, if you're clergy, Rob, name some things we can't do. And Glenn, name some things we can't do. War. War. Yeah, we're... Yeah, we think that war is incompatible with Christian teaching. But we got a lot of people in the military. The laity. You guys get to do it all. What, Rob, can you name one that we don't let people do? Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, infidelity. Anything else? Most crimes. Most crimes. All of that ends your vocation very swiftly. Very swiftly. They do not mess around. They, they do not mess around with, with um, any harassment issues. And, and so the church has a lot of processes, and we were early adapters on that. We, we started early, especially child protection policies. We we're in front of that before almost any denomination in America. So there are a lot of standards we hold. And I'm joking about the laity. It's not that, it, but the point is, Corey, we don't kick people out of the church. And there are churches that you could be a part of that if they found out you smoked, drank, danced, or kiss girls who do, you would be out. That's never been us. But our clergy, we do, we continue to have these standards, so that's why that. Do you have another question? Yes. <laughs> that was awesome. She is curious about the timeline for how this all lays out, and so what would be great is if I had a slide, there it is. Yeah, so here's the timeline. Thank you for that question. That was really good. Like you and Dave. Same row, right? Or a row back? That was pretty good. Okay. This is when the Council of Bishops will consider the plans. That's not next week, but the week. It's like, what's April 29th? Is that a Sunday? That's a Sunday? Yeah, it's the next Sunday. Okay, they start next Sunday. 
then the commission has its meeting May the 14th. And I think what's going to happen is the bishops may come back and say, we like this, but can you make these changes? The commission has two writing teams. And those of us who have served on these writing teams have been way down the weeds on this stuff. Um, the writing team I'm on wrapped up on Thursday at 5 p.m. That's when we finish our work. And so um, we'll meet again. And the other question is, once they get a plan, are they going to ask people in the commission to go and help share it and talk about it? I don't know. July 1st, the final report will go out. You won't see a final report until July 1st because when we publish things in Methodist Church, we have to do it in four languages. And that's because we're in the Philippines and in Africa and also in some Spanish-speaking spaces. And so um, we, we've learned that the rest of the world finds it a little colonial when we publish in English, and then they get theirs three months later. They don't like that. And we thought that was kind of fair. Uh, the church did, not the commission. And so it'll come out July 1st because it'll take that much time to translate it. And then uh, delegates will prepare in the summer and the fall of 2018. So I'm one of the delegation leaders from Virginia. We'll prepare our delegates. It's going to be a lot of preparation. And the reason it's going to be a lot of preparation is we need to not just prepare them in one or two plans. We need to teach them all the families of plans. Because if somebody comes to the microphone and says, I would like to substitute all that is before us. You've got to be ready to have the conversation, and it's a four-day general conference. So you're not going to have a lot of time to do learning, and you've got to know it before you go into it. So it'll take a lot of preparation. And then in February, the 23rd through the 26th, sorry about that. I may have done that this afternoon in my office, that one particular slide. We will have the special um, conference, special general conference, and, that's, and that'll be held Get this, it's in February, we're holding it in St. Louis. Won't that be interesting if we get like a foot of snow? That could, that could change everything, right? And then God did a miracle, and like three people showed up. They took a quick vote and went out, and you know, it was great. So I don't know, we'll figure that out. But um, that's, that's the timeline, and that's what I'll be doing. Yes? Did you say the word discouraging? Yes. I do too. Yeah. Lord, in your mercy. Nothing like, yeah, and I think that's the thing is the feeling that nothing, it's not that nothing changed, but that the change wasn't really decided. It was a default setting that we just returned to. It's one thing if you decide. It's another thing if you just don't have the ability to decide. Well, probably... Um, the Judicial Council has already said that some of the things that a deep traditional plan in the past that's been offered, the Judicial Council already said some of that is not constitutional. So, so there's only so far that you can go to that end. And, and United Methodists of all types are generous people by nature, has been my experience. It helps when you get them in their best space, like all of us. So... Um, yeah, it is a little. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'll work on that. I'll make something happen. I've really been trying to make something happen, believe it or not. Um, and, you know, seriously, I've spent some extra time with people on both ends of the spectrum trying to build relationships. And, and what I've, I've said to folks is, hey, we, we, we've got to do this work in such a way that we all like each other walking into the 2019 General Conference not because deals are made in back rooms, not that at all. Sometimes, though, legislation at a general conference happens on a 30-minute break with people standing around a, a circular table, and you have to have relationships of trust in order for that to happen. So a lot of the work that I've been doing, I've been intentionally, along with others, it's not just me, but many of us on the commission have been really trying to spend time with each other, diving deep into those relationships just for that reason. Jesse.
church is a church that, unlike, say, Catholics, what we try to do is allow the individual to talk directly to God. So what I'm kind of saying on this is there's so much going on in here. I, I, I'm not opposed to you, everybody making a decision fast, but if we're not ready, I haven't heard, this is the first time that I've come to any of these things where we even really talked about the issues other than the process issues. We didn't talk about the issues. And when I asked why uh, are we going to, after we've talked with everybody, learn to talk to everybody, we're going to feed that information back. To me, that's the missing link. Yeah. Because I'm not sure this congregation has had enough time to, to talk so that we don't feel misunderstood. So let me try to capture some of that. Um, and, and I'm going to do that as best I can. Absolutely. Jesse's pointing out that change is difficult. Amen? We'd all agree? So change typically, he didn't use this phrase, but I'm going to add one. Change is well served by a change management system. Now, what I've been telling my fellow clergy in the United Methodist Church is you have two options on this thing. You can either do change management or you can do crisis management. Crisis management hardly ever goes well. So you want to start talking about this early, and you have to start at the inflection points where you have information. Jesse pointed out that this is one of the first times that we've actually talked about some of the issues. And we might say that's really bad. We haven't talked about the issues, but we might say that's good. By the time we started talking about the issues, we actually understood the process. A lot of times people start talking about the issues without understanding the process. That's not good change management. So in Flor let's just take Florida United Methodist Church as one example of a congregation. For us to process this, we're going to have to keep doing what we're doing. And that's why I keep holding events just like this. But now we've developed a small group system that goes to a deeper dive where you really talk and learn about issues in the LGBTQ community. And you learn the language to use and the terminology. And that's what Anna has is created and is offering to us. And so Jesse properly points out that Methodists are going to have to do that work everywhere. And I would say, to your point, you're right. And some churches are going to do it well, and some churches are going to do it really poorly. I don't understand why my colleagues, in many cases, have not talked about this at all, have not pointed people just to United Methodist News Service articles that they could offer. They haven't even done that. But some of my colleagues have done a great job, and they've really started into it. But I think the closer we get to that general conference, you're going to see the momentum gaining weight. I think we just started earlier, and that's because I have the unique situation being on the commission, and because I'm spending so much time, I want to report out to you all how that time is being used. That's why we've talked, and I also have a confidentiality agreement, which... is when do we get to the place where laity can encourage and influence the, you use the word elite, I would, I, I don't like that terminology because I don't think it's fair, because these are people that are voted to be general conference delegates, and if you get to know them, they are not elite in any form. But I will say, it's representative democracy. It's not pure democracy, and so it does feel that like only a few people get to make these decisions. But those representatives have the vested authority of the whole, and they have been duly elected through the proper processes. And so, no, really, the Methodist Church is, um, its governance is based on U.S. governance. So, there will be places where people can talk. And, the, and the, our church will continue in this process. I think other churches will, too. But I will tell you this. At the end of the day, there are 800, I think the number was 864 delegates. Those 864 people will decide for the 12 million of us. And that's a fair statement. Sure. Just the, the, what I'm getting at, though, is this is such a big change that's happened so fast. Ten years may sound like it's a long time, but in ten years, we've seen changes on how society treats yep. this group. So one thing I would point to is the long timeline. Prior to 1972, that language was not in the Book of Discipline. The Book of Discipline was silent about the practice of homosexuality. 
Now, we could say, yeah, but nobody was proposing in 1972, no one was really actively proposing same-sex marriages. But when, they, when that began to happen, then language was written in. So your church hasn't been doing this for the past 10 years. 1972 to, 19, to 2018, what is that? That's 45 years. So we've actually, and if you've followed the history of this thing, and if you've, I've been to four general conferences now, trust me when I say it's been a lot longer than 10 years and the conversation is ongoing. And frankly, I love being in a church that's trying to hold traditional people in the same room with progressive people and everybody in between because there are, my experience is, that serves intelligent decision making. I think we become less intelligent overall when the only people we talk to are in our own camp. And I think there's a lot of that in the country right now, and I think it's very unfortunate. So I love that about our Methodist church, and I really like it about America when it's true in America. And, um, but, but Jesse, I do hear what you're saying, and I, and I think change has to be taken slow, and, and and I've been the one, what's funny is in the Virginia Annual Conference, when I talk to clergy, I'm you. And that, as you, you know me and I know you, and I know that feels odd for you to know that I'm you in that context. But I've been telling people, if you don't start talking about this, it's going to be a mess. And it really will be. So thank you for, for being here. So, hey, um, I'm going to take about one more, um, my pump, I'm turning into a pumpkin. So I'm going to take one more question. So, um, Let's, I'm going to take two questions. I'm going to take two. I'm going to take yours, and I'm going to take yours. Yeah, 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 that's really fair. So if you're a person who wants to get married in a church, that feels like a long time. If you're a person that has children, LGBTQ persons that are your children, like that feels like a long time. So how do we do both and? One of the things, one of the reasons that I've asked Anna to start these small groups and to make that a priority in the coming year is one of the most important things we can do is learn how to have the conversation. And a lot of that is learning vocabulary. Our commission had to take a whole like three-day deal to build a glossary of terms because when we started the conversation, whew, people did not have an understanding of terminology. And just to create peace within the commission, we stopped everything and said we've got to teach each other. And the great thing was people were so willing, but especially you can imagine members from Africa, they don't do this work. They don't have this conversation. And so the, there was a lot of stumbling around and, frankly, a little bit of hurtful language. And, you know, after about the third person got up and left the room, we thought, maybe we're not doing this great, you know. And so we did. And so around the local church, I think we have to do that too. And then I think your point about being misunderstood, Teresa, about what was the word you used? You, feel, you felt, did you say I felt misunderstood? Yeah. That is... That is what I hear all across the spectrum. But I got to tell you, nobody feels more misunderstood than gay people in this conversation, to my experience. So being very gentle about how we say things and what we say, even as we have the conversation. And, you know, the great thing is that's biblical because the spirit, when the spirit is present amongst us, it gives us a spirit of gentleness and self-control. Trust me, we're going to need it in the next year. And then, yes, here. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, I've been a lot of great people. So the, the question is, looking at that circle, what percentages might I allocate that within the total church? Well, one of the things that's difficult that, about that is they're not all in one place or in one church. They're sprinkled. 
Now, there are churches that tend to be, have a center of gravity in one space or another. Um, this is not my number, but when I asked someone that's in the leadership of a large renewal group that is very traditional, and I said, what percentage of United Methodists are traditional non-compatibilists? His answer was probably 20. It's not my answer, I don't have any numbers. I try not to talk about numbers when I don't have any numbers, but if that guy wants to say what he thinks it is, I don't mind reporting it to you. I've never had anyone who is progressive say a number, but I have had progressive people that are in other parts of the country say, I bet the total number is smaller than the number that are over there, that are progressive non-compatibilist. Because this, the Western jurisdiction is fractional compared to the rest of the, of the thing. And the Northeastern jurisdiction, which tends to be more progressive, is also smaller. So, so those folks would say that. But the truth is, we don't have any numbers at all. So it would be, um, you know, I would say that, and then you would say later, how do you know that? And I'd say, I'm making it up. And then you'd say, well, that doesn't, <laughs> you know, there we are. And I, I don't like that. Did they change? No. But they did have dinner together a lot. <laughs> and one of my favorite things is that one of the people who's an older person who, who is in one of these renewal groups always hangs out with one of the guys, one of the men who's gay, who's very progressive. And they just like each other so much. And see, for me, that's being Methodist. It's these people who don't agree, but they like each other so much that they enjoy seeing each other. But did they change their opinion on this issue? Absolutely not. Um, Marty, you're the only hand that didn't get answered, so I'm just feeling guilty about that and negative about myself. But you're it. So make the question good. I think a lot of people were feeling really good about 45. <laughs> yeah, I'll take 45. How about the rest of you? Are you going to go with 45? Yeah. We do have one other person who's under uh, 25, so, or 30, under 30, yeah. So, so the question is, does, has the commission recognized that different ages may think differently about these issues? But, Okay, so you see that reflected here. I've heard very progressive people say that, and you see it reflected here. I've heard a lot of moderates say that. Traditional people that I have talked to, and I've asked that very question to, tend to say there are a lot of young adults that are traditional, which is true. Now, when you say what percentage, they tend not to have those numbers, but that's, I can't fault them. I don't know how many younger people are progressive on this issue. But many people believe that this will be a less dramatic discussion in 10 to 20 years. 
the average United Methodist right now is, help me, Rob, 58. Okay? So you take 58 and you add 20 to it, and you're to an age where you don't typically like going to meetings anymore. You may be in the great meeting in the sky, <laughs> but you may just be somebody who's alive here and been like, I've been there and done that and I'm never going again, right? So the, the point is, um, there are many, on all along this spectrum, there are many people that are saying, yeah, in 20, because the truth is the demographics are changing on this and they may go back, they may default back to a more traditional space, but demographics on divorce have not gone back. Demographics on women in leadership have not gone back. Demographics, and many believe that these demographics won't shift either. I don't know what the demographics will do, but I'm, I'm telling you what, what I'm hearing. And so, um, but as you can see, there are many people that are very concerned about this exact issue. Um, you tend to feel it a little bit more if your own children look at you and say, I'm not gonna be a part of a church that holds that view. For a lot of people, that's the game changer. So you can say, well, who would compromise their view for the next generation? And the answer is, a whole lot of us do it every single day. Because you know something else the church used to not accept? Your kids living together before they get married. But I guarantee you, if I told the majority of you that I wasn't going to do your kid's wedding because they were living together before they got married, and I therefore morally can't do the marriage, you would be so angry at me, you might stop coming to this church. But when I started in ministry, I used to enforce that rule. And I used to say, when I started in ministry, all those years, 30 years ago, I used to say, we hold a traditional view on marriage, and that means heterosexuals. If you're living together, you need to take a break from that and then come see me and I'll, I'll do your wedding. And I had people get angry. And, but we don't do that anymore. And we don't do that primarily because you all wouldn't back me up if I did it. And we don't do it anymore because the truth is the culture has totally shifted. So the view that we've taken on that now is, well, if they're already living together, we better get them married. <laughs> but you see how simple that is? Why is that so simple for us to say? Because most of us in this room are heterosexual and we understand the desire to live together and have sex with someone we love before we're married. And that very high level of empathy has shifted our practice. When you talk to gay people, what they, would, what they tend to say is, it's interesting around your sexual ethics as heterosexual people, that you actually enforce a much higher sexual standard, sexual ethic for LGBTQ persons than you do for yourselves. Now, I think the great opportunity in this is if, if we start doing gay marriages, we can actually talk about sexual ethics that are applicable to all of us, right? And then there's a whole bunch of behavior we might start addressing how all of us, gay and straight alike, tend to use a lot of pornography, how all of us tend to have a problem with fidelity, how all of us have engaged in irresponsible acts of casual sex that sometimes lead to harm to our bodies or children who, have, who are born with absolutely no parental support except the one mother who carries them. But see, we, we really can't do much sexual ethics work with the gay community because what we tell them is if you do anything, it's all wrong. And so, Marty, your question's a really valid one, but you, you see how much deeper the conversation just got right there? So that's a great place to stop. <laughs> that's a great place to stop because, um, because if I stop right there, it stinks to be you the same way it stinks to be me. <laughs> and you get to think about something on your way home. Listen, friends, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you.